I'm ready when you are. Yeah, I'm ready too. This is uh, the Wisdom Factory. I'm Heidi in Italy, and I'm here with Tom Habib, Dr. Tom Habib, as you see here on the on the screen. And we are doing a preparation for the Integral European Conference, uh, and we will be talking about uh, Tom's topic. From Resonance to Coherence, a Path in Pursuit of We Space. And at this point, I would introduce uh, you in the conference, but people can go to the Wisdom Factory and uh, put in the search function your name. We have done several uh, conversations together, and there's always the About the Tom <laughs> Habib section, so you will see it there. But if you want to, you can say just a little bit, just two or three words about you and sort of a check-in, and then we start, okay? Okay, Heidi. Um, good afternoon or morning. Um, I am a clinical psychologist by training, and I've been involved in Integral for 11 or 12 years now. Uh, Heidi and the dearly beloved Mark had a lot to do with uh, exposing my work, which I'm internally grateful to the Wisdom Factory. And I'm going to share a bit more about today's topic from coherent, from resonance to coherence, the path to we space and how it relates to my work as a couples therapist. Okay, go ahead, dive right into it because I can ask you, when I see the title, I don't know what that means. <laughs> well, that's going to be part of what we're talking about today is from resonance to uh, coherence and a path to we space. And let me set it up before I say too much about that. Um, so as I mentioned before, I'm a clinical psychologist specializing in couples therapy. And as you and I have done, Heidi, we've worked a lot on taking a look at the highest stages of what couples are capable of doing. And You've heard me mention before, couples are the most difficult people to actually bring into resonance and coherence, that level of intimacy, because there's so much exposure that it's actually easier to do it with strangers than couples. So that's part of my work is from San Diego Integral, uh, not that they're totally strangers, but they're friends, they're not lovers, obviously that it's easier to, to work on some of these concepts, this we space concept here, and then bring it into couples. Um, and so it's this interaction between um, working in couples therapy and then um, you know, working with other people capable of holding this type of space. So if I can keep moving. <clears throat> The average social interaction between people, it typically involves just a consensus on the good, the not so good, and the exchange of experience and information. It has a superficiality about its small talk. It only briefly touches upon experiencing presence because it's chronically inhibited by concerns for acceptance, safety, and that constant need for affirmation to see how do I stand with you. But even this inhibited encounter is driven by a hunger for communion and discovery. So as a state experiences, it goes from the small talk of the growth state to even the subtles begins to develop in average conversations. So now, what I want to dis dis distinguish between is individual presence and collective presence. Individual presence is something that we all work on in meditative practices and uh, cleaning up, growing up. But collective presence is a totally different thing. In an individual presence, the state experience for most integralists is somewhere definitely in the subtle, if not causal state. In the collective presence, 
It begins with resonance, that's the energy. I'm gonna define that as we go along. Coherence, and then to we space. So I wanna talk a bit about presence first as an individual state, not collective. It's where we are capable of staying with our own feelings while sensing others and possibly generating resonance, which it would be collective. And in order to, uh, honor to uh, Otto Schammer, who's going to be pres presenting, presencing is about opening up to a moment, to the larger space of field around us, to an expanded sense of self, and ultimately to what is emerging through us. A little bit more. The most important thing going forward is breaking the boundaries between people so that we can operate as a single intelligence. And he's calling this, in 2005, he called it in his book, <clears throat> a science of connectedness. And I'm calling it collective presence as uh, collective uh, presence, Benita Roy is using that also. So I'm only gonna emphasize the left uh, side here for the time being, we'll get back to this. So here's the individual presence. And on the right side is the collective presence. And the skills we use, the tools we use to be able to show up and with good individual presence to the moment is obviously meditation, mindfulness, <clears throat> cleaning up, growing up, waking up, all play upon the quality of showing up. And you, you recognize that from Ken Wilber's work. And people that can have individual presence, and it's crucial to show up collectively, there's a familiarity with the inner world so that when that shows up in the collective, people don't overreact, you know, at that moment. And I see that in therapy many times, you know, where um, you overexpose somebody in a moment and they panic a little bit. They go, I don't do that all the time. And it, it's kind of like in, in that moment, discovering that subtle aspect of themselves becomes almost overwhelming. So you, you can see why it's really important that it, it's there. Yeah. Okay, let's keep going. So, I'm sorry. Today, uh, we're gonna start with recognizing resonance and uh, before we go to coherence. So, so resonance is a collective state. Uh, I'm sorry, this thing's flicking through quicker than I wanted it to. So resonance is the felt perception of energy between two or more folks. Sources of resonance can be external resonance, like nature. I remember Hardy, once you talked about power areas in nature um, that would generate resonance. Yeah. Um, it can also be appointment moment in a video that we're gonna use today. <clears throat> but resonance can be ge generated internally also between two or more people. So here's resonance, an external source. And for those of you on video, it's people reacting to something going on, but you can see the manifestation, the embodiment of the energy that they're feeling. And this is, even though it's a collective experience, they're not turning towards each other. They're, they're focusing on an external source. And that happens uh, oftentimes. And you can see, we're, just, we're trying to language, how do we actually show up in these moments and what are the nuances of it? So here's another example of the collective state, another ex external source of resonance. For those of you on videos, uh, it's a field, I believe, in Hungary. I think you were there with me, Heidi. And uh, yeah. the flowers are, do you recognize these flowers? I, I think it's lavender. 
Lavender? Yeah, uh, lavender, yes. Lavender. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a beautiful purple, soft lavender feel with green all around. And you can feel it, how it slows down our physiology and how it shows up. So this is external source of resonance. Um, and this one I'm gonna ask you, is it internal or external? So on the top left are two women hugging. You know, it looks like they went through an ordeal. And on the bottom right is Helen and Jeremy dancing at IEC. And look at Helen's face. You know, the energy in that moment that they're feeling collectively together is, um, it's incredible. And if you see on the left, you can see the gentleman in the orange shirt, and he's feeling that energy also as the one on the right. And there's a few of the people in that uh, whose picture's a little blacked out, but you can see how magnetic that is, that what wants to emerge is that level of contact. So, and, and this for Helen and Jeremy, Heidi, would you say it's internal or external? The, the, right, the right photo, uh, Helen, uh, I think that's external because she sees him and has this expression towards him, while the face on the other side is more going inside. It's more, I don't know, that's spontaneous, what I would say. I don't know. It's uh, okay. It's right. Well, it's brand new. <laughs> you know, actually, Helen and Jeremy are developing it internally. It's between the two of them. Whereas the two people I pointed out, the two gentlemen sitting on the left and right, they're experiencing the external source of the resonance. For oh, them. I'm, I was seeing the photos, the embracing uh, two people. Oh, yes. That would be, in, uh, that would be internal too. Yeah. Uh, these would be internal. Yeah, so we're going to do right. more on this as we go. Okay. So. Repeated familiarity with resonance makes it increasingly possible to be sustained or summoned with increasing frequency. And what this means is as we begin to recognize the energy sources, I think, uh, Heidi, you and I have run into people that we can feel their energy as soon as we're in their presence it's kind of like an, an invitation, it's like a doorway. And I mean, none of us totally understand exactly what it is, but we become familiar with that experience and we end up loving and seeking it. Would you say that's true? It's absolutely true, as well as the opposite, you know? When you find people that you really, oh, no. <laughs> yes, as well as the negative energy of they're putting forward and we want to get away from it, you know, whether it's a place or whatnot. So let's go back. So on this scale, I'm laying out the levels of collective presence. The residence at the entry point is very brief. You know, something's going to break the resonance. That we're going to begin to articulate what holds it and what doesn't. A lot of times people need an external source, like we saw in that picture of the people that are in a crowd watching something very powerful. But with familiarity, it morphs into coherence, and it's only distinguished that it's not necessarily generated externally anymore and people can hold it over time. Whereas we space, people just move right in it and they're totally conscious of sustaining it. I don't think there's very many people that can do that. And uh, Jamie Wheel and Benita Roy both have said the same thing. Jamie Wheel says um, people that are playing sports together, they're able to develop a we. 
in the synchronicity of their movements. But as soon as we go verbal, and I think it's because verbiage is an abstraction, it's so easy to get lost in those moments. Um, sporting events, and he also says special forces, they seem to know where each other are. Music, when you do music together, that's a perfect example. I love that one, Heidi. Is uh, One of my clients I was working with said singing a duet to each other has that level that if you really trust that person, I mean, and that's why we love watching it, right? It's just like watching Helen and Jeremy. Mm -hmm. We love people that embody that because it opens space for all of us. You know, in music, that's the, the weird thing that you don't see it, but you feel it. And you know when the you when you are in the we space, no, only in that case, that you start at the same moment. You do the same things. But sometimes you look at each other, but normally it's you just feel it. And that's really a great, great, great thing when that happens. It doesn't happen all the time when you perform, but sometimes it does. And this is <sighs> I remember you singing in that church in Hungary, <laughs> you know, with the great acoustics and yeah. just an acapella. I mean, it was just beautiful. The whole group was like, whoa. <laughs> but I totally agree with what you just said. So today we're going to focus on resonance coherence because I don't think we space happens um, that often. So, um, in order to show up at this, and we did the left side, the tools, collective presence relies upon recognizing resonance. You have to have a shared intention to enter that space. Concurrently, we relax contraction and we open transparency. There's a generosity about these moments. And we're actually opening space for co-mergence, you know, where we can flow together in that area. And then crucially in the verbal realm, communication has to be horizontal. Do you know what I mean by horizontal versus vertical communication? That it is, I see the orchestra or the choir or something that is really spreading through all people. And not one per person is, yeah, they have the director, but the director is part of the, of the group, you know, so that's, it's moving this. I think that's, it's a, that's a really good analogy. If somebody started playing a different song, and that's exactly what happens in communication somebody over, uh, you know, re uh, deep resonance or coherence, somebody overreacts to the physiology and they, they laugh or they say something off topic and then it's gone, you know, for that moment. But again, we're only at the infancy of this and understanding it. And you can see why it's so hard for couples because so much comes up in those moments that people panic and want to get away. All right, so in the presentation, we're going to do uh, groups of four or six, I'm not sure, 15 minutes. And we're going to hold the external resonance, this video. I'm going to play a video in a moment. And um, when you go into the group, I want you to hold the energy. And then you're going to answer these following questions. Can we feel the resonance of the video? So we're using an external source of resonance. When you're with other people, can you feel the tendency to contract? Do you want to pull back? You know, I, I think about doing this, showing up in the moment with Christine and watching a poignant video. And even though I wrote all this stuff up, there's still moments where I'm getting tearful and I'm looking away from my wife. I'm contracting and my transparency drops. I'm not being transparent. And then, as we said before, does the communication stay 
horizontal. So keep these in mind for after uh, we watch the video and um, we can talk about that. Okay. It was about, is she's a, a deaf um, musician and she feels the sound through the stage and she once had audio and she's a, a, a singer and it's, it's really powerful uh, of what's going on. Um, you know, people in the audience are crying and everything. Um, so should we go on from here? Yes, go ahead. Okay, so I'm wondering, Heidi, we, we can feel the resonance from that video. <clears throat> I mean, it's very powerful. Um, what part of the resonance did you react to? Do you have any thoughts about that? I think for me, when I hear a musician who is blind or deaf, what was she? Blind, deaf. Deaf, yeah, exactly. I thought about Evelyn Glennie, who is a percussionist, and she is feeling the, um, the vibrations through her feet. And I am always moved by that, that people are overcoming the deficit in such a way, in an incredible way, you know, so... Well, Beethoven had that same issue, didn't he? At the end. Mm -hmm. At the end. Uh, in order to do it. It is a, quite an extraordinary thing. Um, could you feel the contraction wanting to develop? Uh, of not sharing that with someone? For me, it's now a little bit difficult because in our recording, I didn't see the video actually. So responding to the questions is a little bit difficult. So you better tell me <laughs> what your uh, uh, impressions were. Okay. So it's amazing how immediately we want to contract when we're this vulnerable. And I really think it has to do with vulnerability and protection because we're in a weakened state and it's almost like we don't know that in times of emotional vulnerability we feel like we're in danger you know it, it's part of the upper right to physiology that wants to contract but it doesn't help us because you know, we're not on the uh, Serengeti Plains, and it's not 200,000 years ago. Um, we're in contemporary society, you know, that is a lot more civil and less competitive, and we need more connection. But it is becoming aware of this, so we have a choice of when do I contract, when do I show up and stay open and become transparent. And then the horizontal communication amplifies it. It's where we get to share um, what our experiences were. And it's where we're actually bonding, whether it's an intimate relationship or not. This is what's happening in that moment. Um, we're actually bonding. Okay. So, um, we're going to move to, the, that was resonance. Now we're going to move to coherence, and I want to be able to define this. And remember from this slide that the difference between resonance and coherence is the amount of time <clears throat> in that you get two people that can generate it internally, although they can do it from an external source, but that they, they both show up and they can sustain it for increasing periods of time. So let's define it first. Coherence is possible between folks with robust individual mindfulness practices who can jointly recognize and focus resident energy. I mean, that makes sense. Two people who are really strong in their individual practices, then they both recognize it 
he can focus it. It occurs when resonance is sustained, amplified, or described between two or more individuals for a brief but increasingly absorbi absorbing period of time. It's even more powerful um, and absorbing when we experience it. The coalescent of, coalescence of this state experience moment, momentarily shifts a group of two or more people from an assemblage of collective eyes into the unity of we. And that's the difference. Are we just showing up collective eyes, which we even do at the conferences when we're listening to the speakers? We're not experiencing the we's until we get into the, the breakouts. So that's what happens uh, in coherence. So in this section, uh, we're going to break out into gr groups of six, I think, for 15 minutes again. And we're going to use Rumi's poem. And the good thing about this one, Heidi, is we can do this one together without a video. And we're going to answer the following questions. In your group, um, who generates the strongest coherence? There's always somebody in the group that seems to have that ability. What are they doing to provide coherence? And then what did they do to, did somebody in the group do to derail coherence? So you are talking about the breakout group here? Yeah. But they, yeah. they are in the same breakout group, so they, they find the people again, probably. Because otherwise, how can they know? Because they're going to be dialoguing about this poem ah. in the group. Okay. So the questions come later. Yep. Okay. Yep. So here's the poem you're going to talk about in the group. And you're going to watch those three questions. And a lot of you have seen this. This is Rumi's poem from the 13th century. It's amazing he knew this 600 years before Freud even came onto the scene. So, out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there's a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Ideas, language, even the phase, each other, doesn't make sense. So, you and I were in a breakout room talking about it, and we're looking at who generate the strongest coherence, what did they do to provide it, and who derailed it. So, some of this conversation I think we've already had, and um, I'm curious, how do you develop, identify people with sustained resonance, who have coherence? Um, when you encounter a mighty, how do you recognize it? I just feel it. I cannot say how I recognize it. There is a certain initiative, a certain energy, and a certain welcoming at the same time, a certain offering of space where the others can enter. Uh, it's now I'm trying to, to, to give names to what I'm feeling when this happens. Um, I like that. What you just said, though, is that that embodiment of the feeling you're having helps us identify it, doesn't it? Yeah. I just tried to remember the feeling and to see somebody like that also in front of me and then try to detract this, uh, to understand what they are, what it is, what I'm feeling, you know? I'm not sure if they are like this, but that's what comes over to me, so. Yeah, I like that. Um, people have languaged that as they open space. That's almost an invitation yeah, to join invitation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And 
um, can you feel the attraction towards it? It's kind of like, you know, you're moving closer to the fire on a cold evening. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah, that's it. And, um, but it's a mirror, amazing. And that, that even shows up at coherence. And remember what we did is we said that coherence shows up as subtle, as an individual, deep, subtle, a causal energy. So when our individual practices recognize when it becomes causal, which is what Rumi's talking about, right? Is then it's much easier to um, open that space for for people. And I don't know what it is either. This is what I'm looking at both in couples and uh, in San Diego Integral and dialogues with people like yourself is I don't understand everything going on. I know it has an embodiment function that when we're in that space, our body language is inviting and somehow resonating that type of energy in that moment. And I don't think it's only body language. I think it's the a complexity of signals which arrive at you. And you just feel uh, in some way completely accepted also and completely welcome. And you are losing fear. Uh, you, you feel connected, I would say. And um, yes, and a facilitator, a good facilitator can do that. But I don't think it's only tools. That's sort of an energy which is half conscious, half unconscious, I think. In, in some way, for me, it's a miracle. <laughs> and some people are more gifted and some less, I would say. Yeah, I, I totally agree that a lot of it is unconscious energy. But uh, as Barbara Max Hubbard used to say, um, she used to speculate it's the next evolution of she said we went from, we're going from homo sapien sapien to homo universalis in our evolution and again that's really borders on total speculation and metaphysics but it's a possibility is uh those of us on this edge of consciousness and what we love about it can find different models we have a roadmap like aqua to help us understand you know how does this show up in the lower left what are we going to do up in the upper right what are we going to clean up in the upper left and then how do we actually develop practices in the lower right that we articulated it out so you can see what i'm doing i'm looking at the external sources the internal sources and trying to utilize that because like with couples i find that when I expose them to this, they kind of know that there's a very intimate place that exists if they can quiet down. And then I'm, I'm constantly saying that giggle was not pushing you away. That was an energy that couldn't be transmuted in that moment. It overwhelmed the emotional circuitry. Um, you know, which tends to show up with couples. So, all right, let's see if we can finish up here. So, in this slide that you've seen, I want to collapse out the left side of this slide and expand uh, the right side. So here it is. And this, again, is the tools of collective presence. So again, we recognize moments of resonance. You know, Heidi, I, I think about the last time we were in some crypt um, in some church in Hungary and the acoustics were wonderful. And as soon as people felt the, the, the acoustics, do you remember we all started chanting? The guide was trying to pull us out of there. And we're like, no, we don't want to go. We're enjoying the heck out of this. You know, collectively as a group, the beauty of the integral people is they recognize those moments and they do it. We did it again 
in the baths in Budapest, you know, we started chanting and floating each other. Because in that group, we all share that intention, looking for it, and we're more than willing to relax the contraction and show up with transparency and generosity. So we get the convergence, and then hopefully we keep the horizontal communication. Three more concepts. We recognize the ignition in larger groups. Who ignites it? But it only takes one person to ground out the energy. So Wilbur calls it a room of the capable, and other people have talked about it. Who, who in the room matters? Because there can be an ignition source in a larger group, but it can get lost immediately with intellectualization or anything. That's why uh, Jamie Wheel does talk about it's much more possible in dyads than it is of large groups. And I think this is one of the reasons. Yeah, is and the there is, as soon as there is one person not, not um, being generous and being on the same level and yeah. interfering, that can distract the whole uh, group space, we space. We might be able, the others might be able to hold it, but it's it's very vulnerable as soon as somebody shows up and is not willing to to be part of it. That's I did several of these experiences and difficult to hold the space going. That's what everyone's talking about. Um, that's what I'm trying to language out. You know, what do we have to show up with, with individual skills? And then when we're in this space, it needs to have practices that we that can contain it. Now, people have used that. Can I create a container that one will generate, ignite that space? Then it's incumbent, incumbent on all the participants to hold that attunement. I love that word, especially for couples, that attunement to what's unfolding in this moment. And um, it's so easy to do, derail. So you can see why I'm putting it on a continuum of time. What we usually do is resonance. Occasionally we get coherence. But there's a talk I did for San Diego Integral called the Shangri-La of a Wii Space. Do you remember the reference to Shangri-La? No, I don't. It's a, it was the British novelist whose name, I'm not gonna be able to pull, but it was a fictitious place of utopian society uh, that people went to Shangri-La. And so I'm calling it the Shangri-La of a Wii Space for the Integralists. Because it really is an aspiration. I don't think it shows up. It's probably um, correlates with, on uh, my scale, spiritual love. Um, although I've never seen a couple like that. Christine and I can't even handle the fourth stage. Uh, first love. We just float up and float right back down into it. But that's where we are uh, at this point. Okay, to finish up. Oops. So, um, the second new point, we shift our locus of awareness so there's interpenetration. Now, this is getting more causal, isn't it? As a state experience. This is coherence and deep causal. So that the interpenetration, I can feel this when I'm doing therapy, that when they're in their space and I'm entering their space with them, um, I can feel their struggle in that moment. I don't totally understand it. It's, you know, empathy seems like such a hollow word and it doesn't have that interactional quality 
But I even had people say to me, you tend to say it before I can even say it, of what emerges in that moment, which I try not to do. Um, but that's the interpenetration of being aware, whether it's the group feeling really dumb or in a dyad of two people is, can I feel that? Um, I had a great moment with, oh God, her name is going to escape me, uh, with a woman from Hungary. And we were doing an exercise at IEC, Heidi. And it was one of those resident moments where we were discussing things. And she told me she was pregnant. The energy, having gone through that with kids, I went, oh my God. And the, you know, and she was obviously, you know, totally anticipating motherhood and all of it. And she was very open and sharing it. And it's like it, it, it rocketed us to a level of coherence that the exercise ended and then we talked and she said, what was that? And I mean, it's only with these people. I didn't have this language yet, but I never forgot that encounter because I was blown away by that. And she was a dancer. You mentioned singers. Dancers and singers, I think, have strong embodiment. And boy, they can show up, I'm finding. And I think that's what really happened is, you know, we found the very poignant moment relative to both of us. and We generated it internally. And we were just swimming in the joy because I could feel it, you know, all, all, all the good stuff that comes with happen with kids, mostly good, right? Um, I could just feel it with her. And it didn't even have to be said. It was like, oh, my God. And I don't totally understand it, but, boy, I felt that experience. So we have chatted. I wish I could pull her name. She does ecstatic dancing. Do you know who she is? She's from Hungary. No, I don't know. I'm going to kick myself later for not remembering. <laughs> yeah. And her and I have chatted, and I said, do you remember that experience? She said, I certainly do. Yeah. And so I knew it was um, mutually powerful uh, in terms of what we did. I want to come okay. back to, to couples because I remember to have experienced it, uh, this sometimes. And then I'm very curious why that I, I we, we, with Mark, for instance, you know, we never could hold that for a long time. And I feel in myself that is a sort of shyness, a sort of, <sighs> you know, not, it's, it's too unusual. And so uh, um, I, I'm falling out. I don't know how it was for him, but uh, I, I realized that I'm falling out of it after a very short time because it's sort of, I cannot hold it long enough. I like that word shyness because it, it speaks to the exposure of that moment. Mm. Again, the good side of that is it's so powerful. We end up sabotaging it. We end up breaking that bond. Exactly. And why do we do that? Oh. Well, I think, you know, we're just not familiar with this is, remember what uh, Christine, my wife said, said, Tom, in order to do this, and we're talking about entering the first love and that exposure, I have to compartmentalize when you're not at your higher self, I have to put that away so it doesn't contaminate that experience. I thought that was brilliant because that's one of the things we have to do. But the other thing is um, when we have an intimate partner, you have to wake up with them the next morning you have to negotiate budgets and chores and and we're just unaware of all the vulnerabilities is 
rather than just be in the moment and totally swim in that like I did with the dancer, you know, we contract. But again, this is an emergent. Down the road when they're much better at this, they're going to forgive us because they're going to realize they didn't realize all the nuances of the lower right structure that is emerging and how we're taught to do this. You know, when we bring up a generation of people that can do this, like I have uh, people that are working with their children and they can hold a really good presence and they make that contact and, and they're four, five, six, seven year old children. They're going, shh, stay here with me. And these people are naturally good people. Maybe you and I can do a talk on this. I'm finding that people that are highly sensitive people have a gift. And they usually show up as an anxiety disorder, like generalized or phobic response. They're a mess. But they don't know how to use that gift. And when I calm them down, they show up with this presence. They don't know anything about the theory of what it is, but they just seem to intuitively have strong presence ability. So like I'm thinking about one of these women, uh, she's an ER physician. Not only does she do it with her kids and the kids are going, mommy, I want to do that again, which is great. But she does it with her patients too. She'll actually grab their face when they're in crisis and go, I got you. I know you're afraid. And it's just changing how she practices in that whole department in the ER. So does this sound like a good place to stop? Yeah, it's very nice also the story. I, I do believe that highly sensi sensitive people have they are suffering about that because everything is coming unto them and then they might be in anxiety, but they have a huge gift. And if they can canalize that, that would be really, really great. Right. But we have to know how to utilize it and not what Gene Houston told, said once, mythologize, don't pathologize. Exactly. And when she said that, eventually it played into me figuring out and I'm finding and this is just anecdotal read that 40% of people that show up with anxiety disorders actually have a gift. And boy, when I calm them down, so maybe at some point you and I can do a presentation on that when I pull that material together. Yeah, good. So with this, is your talk is finished or how, how are the closing words? Um, um, or do you, do you want a questions now? Probably questions will arise in the audience. And so you could answer the question. So I, yeah. I should have thought of some question. <laughs> anyway, we, the, the people who are watching then the video, they can ask questions under the video and then we yeah. might, you know, do the response it's there. So... Yeah, I thank you for that because it's always talking with you is always so interesting. I, I really love it. Uh, all the time I'm learning something because that's also, it's something ordering in my mind. <laughs> I get uh, uh, an idea. Ah, yeah. And that was this. Ah, ah, ah. And that's really a good learning. And I thank you very much for that. And I hope the people at the conference and the people even who are watching this will have a great benefit of it. So I would say, yeah, I would say at this point, we stop uh, the recording and invite the people to follow up with you. Uh, drtomabib.com, no? How, yeah, I, yeah. I write it down in the, in the, in the chat uh, or in, in the um, description, your, your website and people can subscribe for your mailing list and then on who is uh, in california can come and see you no yeah. either as a therapist also on uh, uh, san diego integral uh, that you do regular meetings don't you yes we do we're doing them all virtual but 
yeah, they can join now from anywhere in the world. We're getting people from oh, that's Australia. Good. That's good. Uh, but after the crisis, will you do it in person too? No, and then I think you are doing also courses and and things like that. Uh, yep. Great. So, so thank you. Thank you, Heidi.